Okay, now sometimes if you just click on it, it, it records the computer instead of cloud. So we're still working on May the 19th uh, Zoom meeting. I, we haven't got it posted on uh, YouTube yet because I'm it, it, it recorded on this computer. I'm having trouble actually getting it located and getting it to Brother Painter, but I did find it once, but we didn't get it transferred properly or something to him. Anyway, we'll try to get that done. Um, and I am, uh, I'm leaving in the morning um, for Florida. Um, the South Florida Haitian brothers have a, a pastor's meeting um, Saturday all day Saturday. So <clears throat> brother, they really wanted, they, I tried to, you know, well, better not say more about it, but I, they, they convinced me I need to go. So I'm going flying down there in the morning. And so I'll be in service, I think tomorrow night. And then Saturday, that pastor's meeting. And then Saturday night and Sunday, I'll be in Naples and Sunday night in, I can't remember the name of that little town. Brother George took me there one other time. And then Sunday, they've got three services, morning, afternoon, and night. And then I got to be at the airport at five o'clock the next morning to fly home. So pray for me that I can hold out to the end. Y'all ever heard that request? <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's my Memorial Day weekend. I hope y'all have a nice Memorial Day weekend. Um, okay, so we did cover uh, seven, and uh, I might just regress just a little bit because I want it to be um, understood that um, I, I went over pretty strongly that with the two immutable things. And um, the the seventh chapter, and I, I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone that was in church Sunday morning Bible study got it. But the two immutable things that are spoken of that are spoken of here. Um, let's see if I can even find the scripture that talks about the two immutable things. Somebody find that for me. Um, so may find is, is it in six? Six what? Eighteen. Okay, yeah. That bind two two immutable things. Here I'll share this. that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation uh, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. These two immutable things, uh, once again, uh, number one, uh, when God um, made an oath with Abraham, that's the first immutable thing. Um, which was that in? Let me find the scripture right quick. Uh, Six thirteen. Verse 13, chapter 6. Well, when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. 
saying, surely blessing, I'll bless thee, uh, and multiplying, I'll multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end all, of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability or the unchanging, unchangeability of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. So the first immutable thing was the promise that by oath God made an oath to Abraham and made a covenant with Abraham and that's an everlasting covenant we we're, we're still in the covenant of Abraham uh, by faith and uh, then in the in the second chapter he began I mean the seventh chapter excuse me he begins to talk about the oath. He talks about Melchizedek. Um, and he shows that Jesus, that God made an oath that Jesus was to be a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Um, probably we ought to show here. Here it is in the 21st in 721 for those priests. He's talking about the priest under the Levitical priesthood under the law were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that said to him, the Lord will swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So that what the two immutable things is, is that God made an oath to both Abraham and Christ of an everlasting covenant. He didn't make an oath like that with anyone else except Abraham and Christ. And then he goes on in the eighth chapter to show um, Uh, let's read the first verse. I think that's important for those that are not with us in church. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of, ma of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now there, of course, he's talking about the New Testament body of Christ. A true tabernacle it was made without hands, not not by man. Man made the first tabernacle. Man made the temple, but this is a a temple made without hands. Christ is the one that came and made a new covenant. Uh, I'm I'm going to cover some of that ninth the ninth and chap tenth chapter. We'll cover it more. But I'll say here that there had to be a new covenant. The first covenant was what could not make anyone perfect. That first covenant was there's no way anyone could go to heaven under the first covenant. Uh, there was, you know, there was no new birth. You know, Jesus said you must be born again to obtain this life this eternal life, it would take a new covenant and it would take a new, uh, it'd take a, a new priest of a different priesthood. Le the Levitical priesthood could never make anyone perfect. It was, here's what he says here in verse five, uh, well, let's, let's read verse three. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man, speaking of Jesus, have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. 
In other words, those priests under the Levitical priesthood and under the law of Moses, that was a shadow, a picture of what was coming that was in Christ. But Christ was not of the, he wasn't of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. And God had already made him a promise by an oath that he would be an high priest. In fact, we went over that about, you know, the writer here of Hebrews says, consider how great a man this was, this, this Melchizedek. And he goes on and says that he had no beginning. He had no ending. He had no mother, no father. Um, it, it takes basically, I think it takes somewhat of a, because the writer here is not explicit about it, but I think the more you understand the word of God, the more you'd understand that Melchizedek would have had to have been Jesus. Um, he shows up and after a war, you know, Abraham and the battle. And and um, Abraham pays ties to him. He's a priest of Salem, which is a priest of, uh, Salem is another name for Jerusalem. And he's a, pre, a priest uh, of peace. Um, so here he shows up in the Old Testament. But you never, ever, there's no, we, we have no idea where he came from. We don't know of any of who his mother and father was. We don't know where he went. We don't know that he died. We don't know anything about this man. He never, we don't know nothing more about him, but he showed up there with Abraham. Abraham paid tithes to him. And he blessed Abraham. And, and even the writer here shows that the Levitical priesthood paid tithes to Melchizedek, honoring him in a higher place, a higher priest. Even though they didn't exist, they were in the loins of Abraham. That, that he, he carries it that far to show that because of Abraham's recognizing him, that um uh, that that the that the Levites paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek. Anyway, so uh, some people don't see it, and they just see it as a type that you know he was like Melchizedek. But I think it's actually stronger than that. You know, the writer again here says, "Notice," he said, "What." how great of a man this was. He, he carries that pretty pretty strong. Somebody got a question? I, I thought I heard somebody. Okay. Okay, so then he there had to be a new covenant. Je number one, Jesus could not. He could have never married on the day of Pentecost by new covenant. He couldn't have made a new covenant with a new people, a new woman, a new church. Had he not died, it took the death of a testator. He could, he was married to Israel and he could not put her away. It took a death for him to be able to marry another. And so the death of Christ made it possible that he could marry again on the day of Pentecost and have a new covenant with a new people. That new covenant was a covenant that could make the comers to perfect. Jesus perfected a new covenant in that he made it possible that you could be born again of God's spirit, that you could, uh, you could be born of God's nature, God's character, and you could overcome the nature of Adam. And so it took that covenant to make uh, heaven possible, everlasting life possible, and it took a new priest that had something higher to offer than the Levitical priesthood had to offer. He was 
Judah, the kings were of Judah, and he was a king and a priest. Um, he, he, that's what uh, the bride, the bride will be kings and priests, um, a priesthood under this new covenant. So it required, it absolutely required a, a, a covenant. Now, here in the ninth chapter, he starts going through uh, the, the old shadow. There verily, then verily, the first covenant, I'm in the first verse of chapter nine, had also ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuary. There were 413 ordinances of the law of the Ten Commandments <clears throat> that they added these ordinances, you know, like uh, the the dietary laws, dressing laws, the Sabbath, uh, all the different laws of the covenant, of the, of the old, tab old, old covenant. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick. And when he's saying here, he's talking about the holy place. He's not, he, you know, they call the sanctuary, the tabernacle, that word tabernacle there, um, it should show here somewhere. Well, it doesn't under this. It's also called a sanctuary. It's 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 translated from habitation once there, but it's translated from sanctuary to tabernacle. I know. Um, so the, the first, which is the holy place, wherein was the candlestick, the table, and the showbread that sat on the table, the 12 loaves of unleavened showbread, which is called the sanctuary there. He, he's calling that the very same thing, the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that buttered, budded, and the tables of the covenant. That was the, the Ten Commandments, the golden pot that had manna in it, just, you know, part of the manna to show the, the food from heaven that came down, Aaron's rod that budded, the Ark of the Covenant, that the, the the table set in, uh, the golden censer, that was only used by the high priest. Uh, here he doesn't mention um, the, um, the golden altar right here. But, and, there even he even says a little while so it's hard to explain, but the best they've been able to come up with is that when the priest, when the high priest took coals off of the brazen altar, took them up and put them on the golden altar, that he took the veil or the curtain of the second compartment, which was the Holy of Holies, and pulled that curtain back over the top of the golden altar, and the incense caused smoke to fill the Holy of Holies. The high priest was not to go in there until there was a complete cloud, and, and the thought is, is that that incense made a cloud of smoke that he was able to go in there. Um, Anyway, I've researched that quite a bit, and that's the best that I've been able to, to come up with, because if you notice that the, somebody may come up with a better answer than I've got to, which half, okay, the, the golden censer is in the Holy of Holies. And that censer is used to sprinkle um, incense on the altar, golden altar, I believe. Uh, okay, verse five, and over at the cherubims, I mentioned that, shouting the overseat, I mean the mercy seat, 
of which we can not now speak particularly. I don't know why that verse is there. To be honest with you, I don't have an answer for that verse because those two cherubims, well, the, I would probably say it's because those two cherubims were gone when he, when he wrote this from the temple because they were carried away more than once. They were carried away, Assyria carried them away um, and, and got everything gold out of the, out of the uh, the temple uh, when they when they put it into cap when they put them into captivity, but those were the two golden wings that at one at each end of the altar that their wings touched one another and they overshadowed the ark of the covenant. Verse six here says, now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second with the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. You remember once a year uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles during at the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in and offer blood of the sacrifices he'd carry from the brazen altar. He'd carry that in and offer it for himself, and then he would offer also for the, all the people. And once a year, their sins were wiped clean. And the rest of the year, if you needed to offer up a sin offering, you can offer that up any time. But once a year, your slate was wiped clean. Um, that didn't, by the way, God forgave the sins, but it didn't change your sinful character. That's why it couldn't, it couldn't uh, purge your conscience from sin. You still had sin, a sin nature that caused you to sin, and you could not overcome it because you never were born of God's nature that you had the power of the Holy Ghost to overcome the nature of, of Adam or even the human nature, you still, in a human nature, you have a, uh, a will that has to be overcome. You, you've got to, to overcome your will to understand the will. Your will has to become, finally, the will of God, understanding that it's a greater will. There's more wisdom to it. It's, it's righteous. Um, here he says, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holy of ho holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as of the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Not even the high priest could be made uh, perfect concerning his conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation or until the time of the New Testament, the New Covenant. But Christ being come, a high priest for good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. Now that, that right there is wrong. Y'all ought to make a note to that. That should be the holiest of ho the holy of holies. He didn't, he didn't enter once into the holy place. He lived in the holy place. That's second heaven. But by type, what this means is by type, he, he, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy of holies, having obtained eternal redemption for us. See, the high priest went into the holy, holy, holy of holies once a year. And that once a year, he offered up for the sins of the people. 
He did that every year. Jesus did it one time. He only had to do it one time because he offered up a perfect sacrifice that would remove sin and the conscience of sin by overcoming the Adamic nature. Um, let me show you something here on holy place. See this right here? That, that Greek word is a sacred word. It's translated holy place and holiest of all. It's translated sanctuary, holy place, holiest of all and holiest. This right here means it was translated 11 times. It was in the Bible, four times as sanctuary, three times as holy place, three times as, holy, as holiest of holies, and one as holiness. The translators here did not understand. They didn't understand the type of holy, the holy place and the holy of holies, evidently. So that you ought to make a note of that because he entered one time right here. The holy place should have been rendered holiest of all, the holy of holies. If you don't see that, we'll put it on the shelf. You will see it because that's absolutely. That's one thing you can write down with ink. You don't have to write that with pencil. <laughs> it just should have been. It should have been. Okay, verse 13. For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a helper sprinkling, an unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Look, when Jesus forgave you for your sins, when he offered his sacrifice to God, it was, it not only did God wipe your slate clean, but when you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that Christ died and went into the Holy of Holies so that, it, and you could not have received that without a new covenant, and without a different priesthood. It took a different priesthood and a different covenant to bring that about. I don't know if I'm explaining that as good as, as that, you know, I'm hoping you that I'm explaining it well enough that you get what I'm saying. If not, you certainly can ask questions and I'll try to do better. It makes sense to me, but sometimes it could be said in a way that maybe, you know, it would, ring a bell better. And for this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, by that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. That word right there probably should be everlasting. But anyway, I mean, we're, we're not eternal, but we are everlasting. Um, verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. That's what I was saying earlier. Jesus could not have left. He could not have made a new covenant. It took a death. He couldn't make a new covenant with a new people. I use the term Mary again, which, which is certainly a biblical type, but he could not make a covenant with a new people. He was under covenant promise under the covenant that he made in the Old Testament, the law of Moses, and he had to, there had to be a death for him to leave a new testament or a new will. For a testament is of force after men die. Otherwise, it's no strength at all. While the testator liveth, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. If you remember, I've, I've talked about this more than once and telling how if you go back, you know, in Gen I mean, in Exodus, and you see where God had him make the Ten Commandments and had him call all the congregation up before him, all three million of them, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm laying heavy on that here of late, aren't I? He had them all come up. I don't know how three million. Uh, you know what kind of we we don't do they have a cathedral anywhere that can hold three million people? Anyway, maybe I don't know how they did it, but he had the people come up before him. He took hyssop, which was little plants, dipped it down in the blood and sprinkled it out over the people and uh, sealed them in the blood of the testament or the blood of the covenant. Uh, how he said, he sprinkled both, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath joined on you, unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry and almost all things by the law purged with blood. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission. And I've said this many times. Get the understanding of all of the blood that was to be applied to everything for the forgiveness of sins as sacrifices because the life was in the blood of the animal sacrifice. The life. Uh, Moses, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I might mention, you know, Brother William Souders. He used um, the seventh uh, chapter of, of Revelations where the people wash themselves. Isn't that where that scripture is, where they wash themselves with the blood of the lamb and were made whiter as white as snow? Is that where that scripture's at? Let me just look with you right quick. I don't know what verse it is, but I know it's going to be somewhere along in here. Right here, 14th verse. He's, he asked who these people were. He said, they, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Brother Souter said that was white blood. He called it white blood because <laughs> he wanted them to get it that it was the Holy Ghost was the life that was in Christ. It wasn't natural red blood. Now, there's two things that happen with Jesus' death on the cross. Number one, he fulfilled in a true, actual, natural death so that he'd be a testator to Mary again, but he also had died out to sin. He laid down his life of the Holy Ghost for you and I. He offered, he really didn't offer up red blood. That wasn't the blood that saved us. It was the blood that brought us into a new covenant by uh, the new, the testator being able to be, we be able to be joined to a new covenant with him through his natural death. So he fulfilled two things there, the old covenant and the new, in that he laid down the life of the Holy Ghost that is what was applied to us when Moses sprinkled the congregation with the blood of calves and goats and sealed them in the blood of the covenant. That's not what Jesus, he didn't seal us with red blood. He sealed us on the day of Pentecost. He sealed the people with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which was the life that he had in God that all of that blood of the Old Testament represented. Please get that, get that understanding. The red blood, you, the life of God that was in Christ is what has to be applied to your life, that Jesus died out to sin to give you that life. Um, okay, let me go back to where we was at in Hebrews now. 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place, that see here, it ought to be the holiest of all before he had. Okay. Um, I think I said before it needed to be 
the Holy of Holies. Here also it should have been rendered holiest of all or holy of holies. For Christ not entered in the holy place made in the hand of the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear God, nor yet that he should offer himself. Often as a high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood, with blood of others. And then must often, he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world, talking about the end of the Jewish world, hath he appeared to put away sin by sacrifice of himself. That was the Holy of Holies in type of what he did. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That scripture right there probably needs a little bit of explanation. Let me read verse 28 first. So Christ was once offered to bear sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So uh, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So those that look to Christ, will he, he'll appear to them through the baptism of the Holy Ghost unto salvation. Now here in, he suffered once in the end of the world and he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Then he says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Well, I'm looking at that two ways. Number one, just simply that when every man dies, when every man dies, then there is a judgment of where is this man, what is his destination after death? Is, does he remain in the grave? Or is, is he going to come up in a resurrection of the just or the unjust? Or I think you could carry the statement that it's, it's appointed to men to die out to sin. And after that, the judgment of life. But I think you have to apply both. I, I think you got to understand that um, it, it, it's appointed, if we're going to inherit life, it's appointed to us to die out to sin. But every one of us, everyone that goes to death doesn't always obtain the bride at that point. And so there is a judgment concerning, are they going to be in a resurrection of the just or the unjust or what? Are they living in a time when they could overcome sin? All right. So now verse 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers there unto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscious of sins. In other words, if they could, if they could offer you a sacrifice that would carry you on to overcoming sins, you would have to continually be going back and getting forgiveness for sins again. Eventually you could, you could, you could overcome the sin problem, but it was never possible. But it, in those sacrifice, there is remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it's not possible that, blood, that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Here again, you got to consider the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Just because the blood of a bull and goat would be applied to your life and God would accept it, um, What's the word I'm wanting? He would 
count you worthy because you obeyed his, you obeyed the best he could offer you at the time, which was a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, which was a picture of the blood of Christ or the Holy Ghost being applied to your life. Just red blood of Jesus wouldn't do that for you either. It's going to take something more than a blood, a literal red blood to change your character and cause you to be holy and righteous. Wherefore, when he cometh into the word, he said, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. Thou hast had no pleasure. In other words, that wasn't your the end of your plan. That was a picture of things to come. Then said I, lo, I come. This is Jesus talking. In the volume of the book, it's written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, the first covenant, that he may establish the second, the second covenant, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he offered up one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God for himself, expecting, uh, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering hath he perfected forever them that are sanctified. In other words, that offering of an overcoming life through the Holy Ghost, he perfected a new covenant that made that possible for, for ever for all of them that are sanctified or set apart in that new covenant. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that, he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, I'll write them. That's a direct quote from Jeremiah 31, 31, talking about the end of the Jewish world and the new covenant that Jesus would bring about where this new birth of the Holy Ghost would cause us our character that the law of God's righteousness, not the law of the covenant, but the law of, not the law of the, of, of Moses, but well, you could say that because it, there wasn't anything wrong with the law, but it's the righteousness of God that was in the law that could never, ever change man without the new birth, that finally this Holy Ghost nature of God can finally become a part of our character. It's part of it's our heart and it's our mind. Our mind has been renewed to understand the righteousness of God through the character that God that we've been born of God's character and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission is of these, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Let me, let me back up here to verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness. I don't like that word. Uh, I like the word confidence. I don't think I mean, not the way we use boldness today. That word here is also interpreted 
confidence eight times, eight times boldness, confidence six times, openly four, plainly four. Um, if you notice, let me see. Down here in verse 35, let me go to that. Cast not away your confidence. See that Greek word 3954? It's the exact same word just translated boldness up here. See it? 3954. I wish they had translated that confidence. I don't, you know, I mean, to me, it almost sounds like that we 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 don't fear to enter where angels tread, you know, that I don't feel bold about. And number one, I don't think this ought to be wholeness. I think this ought to be the holy place. I'm sorry, but I just, I just, you know, that word is could also be translated holy place. See, it was four times. I just don't think the translators got it. Having therefore, brethren, confidence. We've got confidence to enter into the holiest. Now, remember, this was a divine order of God in the new, new early church, the New Testament church. We don't have as restored church yet, and I don't think we've got confidence to enter into the holy place yet, but they did. That early church, they had reached that place. It was available to them for them. They had because of the sevenfold light and the truth of God's word they had, they had confidence. It was available to them to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, his natural blood and his Holy Ghost life blood, white blood. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. See, that's, he's showing that that veil is a picture of the flesh. You got to press through the flesh into the inner man to enter into a sinful life, a sinful place. It's take God to help you get there, but it's possible. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with water. See, that sprinkling is like the blood sprinkling over the Israelites in the wilderness that seals them in the old covenant. But Jesus, when he sprinkled the 120 on the day of Pentecost, and that sprinkling continued to every comer to the salvation of the new covenant through Christ. They were sprinkled with that life of the Holy Ghost. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. They knew that AD 70 was coming upon them and there were some that were already you know, being uh, tempted and they weren't gathering themselves together in services. We use that scripture down here, but it doesn't really apply to us like it applied back there. But I think we ought to be mindful to realize how important it is, it is for us to be in services in the body of Christ. Verse 26, for if we sin willfully, after that we received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There's that sin uh, that I don't think we're living in a place that this early church was at yet. But if they fell away after they had received a place, if, if they rejected the body of Christ and the move of God, that full manifestation of God back there, there was no more sacrifice for sin. You could be judged eternally in that life back there before death. You, you, you could lose your place in God. But a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries, he that despised the law died without mercy unto 
under two or three witnesses. Now get this word of how much sore punishment. That word sore means worse. It's a worse punishment than dying without mercy under the law. How much worse punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant whereof wherewith he was sanctified, a un, uh, he was sanctified, he counted it an unholy thing, not then done despite the spirit of grace. That word sore, it means worse, sore or worse. It's translated worse seven times. Sore punishment. God used that as eternal punishment. There, you, you didn't have no hope if you turned away from God when there was a sevenfold light back there in that early church and counted the covenant an unholy thing. Uh, for we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. That takes place in Revelations, the end of Revelations 18 and chapter 19 when the Lord gets vengeance on the judgment in the end of this world that it finalized in Armageddon, just like it was in AD 70 in the early church. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a fight, a great fight of afflictions. See, those people back there went through a great deal of suffering in the end of that world, because the dragon turned against the body of Christ back then, and it was under great persecution. Partly while ye were made a gazing stock, both of by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used, for you had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. That's why it almost seems like Paul, doesn't it? That they, they, you know, he mentions in his letter some where he was, you know, how that they took care of him, gave him offerings and cast not away, therefore, your confidence. I like that word, which hath greater recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you may you might receive the promise. For yet a little while and he shall come and will come and will not tarry. In the end of the Jewish world in AD 70, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. That, mer that word means utter destruction. Right there. Destruction, perdition, waste, damnable. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop here tonight, but... Uh, I hope y'all, I hope I'm able to, to convey how important this book is. There is not another book in the New Testament that shows emphatically the things that are shown in the book of Hebrews of showing God's purpose in Christ. There's several things. The fact that he had to become lower than angels for the suffering of death the fact that he had to overcome sin himself, crying unto him with strong cries and tears to him, the father that was able to make him perfect. And he became the father of salvation. Why it was necessary to have a new covenant, a new priesthood. Um, I think it's important to explain what these two immutable things are and why because that's what shows us why it was necessary. It leads into showing us to what was necessary to having a new covenant and a new priesthood. 
um, he just really gets down to where what we say when we say the rubber meets the road and really identifies with what it takes to be saved eternally and what God did in Christ to make that possible. There's not another book in the Bible that's explicit enough to bring this understanding. And I understand it's a little bit deep. You know, I'm not sure how many people that are not really pretty well versed in understanding of the of the vision that we have in the body of Christ that could ever, ever come to an understanding of this book. So I hope I'm conveying it to y'all. We'll try, I don't, you know, we, I've been taking two chapters at a time, but the 13th chapter is the last one, and we got chapter 11 and 12. We may just have to, you know, I'm not sure I can do any more than 11 and 12, because 11 and 12 are really uh, important chapters, too. So we'll just see where we get next week with it. Brother Painter is, uh, he's posting these on uh, our YouTube page, and uh, I'll post it also, the recording of it, on uh, on our group WhatsApp page. So you can just click that link and get it from the cloud if you want to just go over, you know, riding down your car or it, 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 some at any point that you want to go over it again, you can get it. Um, you know, he'll have it in just a day or two on YouTube also, but it will be, it'll be on the WhatsApp page as a link to Zoom also for you. Tonight, I'll put it on there as soon as it comes back to me in email. I just got to find that, <laughs> that Thursday night, last Thursday night. I got to find that and try to get that to him so we can get it done. I'm 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 hopeful that we'll be able to do that. I know it's in my computer. I've just got to figure out how to get it off my computer and get it to him. I've done it before. I don't know what happened this time exactly. Let's see. Somebody may have sent me some. Yeah, imputed righteousness. That that thank you, Brother Mark. Um so I'll quit. Uh I'll stop sharing here. And um, so I appreciate everyone tonight that are with us. If there's any questions, feel free to ask them while I'm, I'll mention some um, prayer requests that I'd like for us to pray before we go. Um, first, my niece that we've been talking about that has pancreatic cancer. She's 49 years old. Her name is Bonnie Garza, my brother's daughter in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, she's in the hospital. Um, the last report I got, which was last night or yesterday evening, she, they said she may have to have surgery. And if she did, they didn't expect her to live through it. Which to me would be the mercy of God because she's, she's going to go through terrible suffering. I mean, unless God touches her, uh, she's going to go through some terrible suffering. She's 49 years old, and but she got the Holy Ghost the other day, about a week ago, and in prayer while she was suffering and going through things. So, she, you know, that, that, that really uh, makes me feel good. <laughs> that God's dealing and working in her life. So I feel like she would, she'll, if, if she passes from this life at this point, I think she'll be just. And um, so, but pray for her, pray for my brother. He was in the hospital here about a week ago with his kidneys and they weren't working right. I don't, I hadn't got a report of how he's doing. Fred Smith, my brother, Fred, the last thing my dad said to me before he died, he said, son, do everything you can to save your brother. <laughs> He's talking about Fred. And I, he said, promise me. And I said, dad, I'll, I'll do what I can. That's the best I can tell you. I, you know, I, I don't, if, you know, but, you know, 
when I was there and prayed for his daughter and I got him to come over there and uh, we had a really good time in the Lord and he got broken up. We, we all got broken up in prayer and everything. And so I talked to him last week on the phone. He's in the hospital. I said, I'm going to pray for you, Fred. He said, okay, thanks. So he knows God and he's, he's had the Holy Ghost. He, me and him got it at the same time together when we was just little kids. Little Fort Texas under J.B. Leonard's ministry, Pentecostal Church. So he knows God. He's just been away from God for a long time. Then Sister Crafton sure needs our prayers. And if you would just keep praying for her. That's all I know to do. Brother Crafton, he needs our prayers because it's it's tough being a caregiver. And, and especially if uh, the person you're caring for is, is hard, you know, uh, they're, they're going through suffering. And it's hard for them to, to relate to everything they're going through. And so I don't know. I hope, I think they're, I think they're on here tonight, but, or they were at some point. Anyway, pray for Brother and Sister Craft and Sister Wilson. She hadn't been in church in a while. I talked to Sister Sharon Shepherd last night. She hadn't been in church in a couple of weeks. And uh, I had a good visit with her. And she said, I'm coming back to church. And she's been playing her, her horn in church at, on the, in the band. And Brother Michael Smith told me, said, she actually can play a horn pretty good. And she said, well, I'm a little rusty on it, but I'm trying to get better. But she thought she lost her violin, but she found it. She'd play a violin, too. I said, well, whichever one you want to play, just bring it and play. Help us. So she said, I will. I'm coming. So pray for Sister Sharon. Also, um, Brother um, Ray Weaver and Susan needs our prayers. Um, Brother Bill Daniels, remember him in prayer, too. I've had Sister Winogar on my mind lately. She's, you know, she's a widow and she's alone and she's getting up in age. And I just think we ought to kind of keep her in our prayers. Also, Brother Gary Wright in Houston. He's still in the hospital. He's improved some, but his, his you know, he has cancer of the blood and it's not something that's curable. They just can't control it or have been able to control it, but the medication he's been on, um, they would give him a treatment about every two to three months it would last. Now it's got down to where it's just about once every two weeks, but it's not working. His, his blood uh, results are, are not good at all. And he's too weak in the hospital. He needs another treatment right now, but he's too weak to take one. And the oncologist said this week that he's, he won't be strong enough to take one next week. But the treatment's not really working. So they've got another treatment that they're wanting to try on him if they can get him in a condition where he's strong enough to take it. So pray for Brother Wright because he really needs our prayers. He's really, he's, he's I think, I think he's like five years younger than me and he really needs our prayers. And I mean, if you're in that shape in the body of Christ, wouldn't you want people to pray for you? Sure you would. And so let's keep Brother Wright on our, in our prayers. Um, the Houston church, you know, I talked to his son, Chad today and, and I know that family needs prayer. Sister Becky, his wife, it's got to be hard on her, Brother uh, brother Brown. Uh, so let's keep them in our prayers. Uh, the, the, the Pray for my trip in Florida. Pray for the Dominican Republic and the work in Mexico. Uh, you know, we just need God's help right now in several different areas in the in the Dominican Republic, I'm mailing out letters. I don't know when. Is it tomorrow, sister? Uh, she's mailing out letters tomorrow all over the body. 200 and 
75 letters or something like that. I'm asking the brotherhood to help me with some offerings. I, we, I, the needs are just, I can't keep up with the needs. We're build, we built two churches. They're not finished. They're, they're dry enough that people are going to have service in them, but I'm, I'm, I'm needing more money than we're able to come up with. I, uh, this letter tells the brother and I need about a minimum of $40,000 to finish these churches and to, to uh, well, I've just got several needs over there. And so if you would pray, pray that God would help me financially to help the work in the Dominican Republic the finances there are just are just getting to be greater and they're they're significant they're it's not you know men just want you to give them money but these are churches that have real needs and uh brother Emilio Green took his last prostate cancer shot he's cancer free but he had to take one more shot took this week his insurance has always covered every shot we found out yesterday those shots cost $1,000 a shot in the Dominican Republic. He's had 35 shots, but they wouldn't cover. They covered $700 this last shot. So he, he said, I, I need $300 that I don't have for him to give me that shot. He asked me, he said, can you give it? And I said, no, I can't. I don't have enough money to give it to you right now, but I'll try to come up with it. <laughs> But because uh, I just met a $1,600 need over there just this week. So anyway, pray for the Dominican Republic, if you would. And if you happen to, you know, one time Brother Clyde Pack was walking along the sidewalk and he was complaining to God because he didn't have any money. And a $20 bill blew out of a bush right in front of him. And he looked down and seen that $20, reached down to pick it up. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, don't complain to me no more. I know how to take care of your needs. <laughs> so I'm not complaining tonight. I'm just saying, if a, if a thousand dollar bill blows out of a bush in front of you, I think God probably wants you to give that to the Dominican Republic since you've heard this request. <laughs> anyway. That's uh, I guess that's a little bit of fun in with you, but I really do. I really want to try to help these churches. I've got needs that I can't meet. Anyway, yeah, me and brother Emilio, I mean, me and brother Gary Green and the Wichita Assembly bought a brand new van, brand new in 2010, 12 years ago for $21,000. It was a it was a minivan and it was a special deal. It was like a $30,000 van, but we bought it through the government. They had these for churches. We found out about it and we was able to put the money together and buy it, the Little Rock Church and the Wichita Church. Well, I don't have to tell you that 12 year old van is wore out because that 12 passenger van gets about 20 people in it several times a day. <laughs> They can put 20 people in a phone booth. Anyway, uh, pray for the Dominican Republic. Who have I left out here? Uh, sister, I mentioned Sister Wilson. There's needs. I know everybody's got unspoken requests, but if you want to have a spoken request, let us Brother know. Brother Bill Daniels. Yes, Brother Daniels, Bill Daniels. Uh, Brother Smith, sorry. Yes. Uh, Brother Goss went in hospital yesterday mm -hmm. with uh, anemia. He, they think he might have a bleed, so they're going to be doing a scope tomorrow. Okay, thank you for reminding me. I certainly should have remembered to mention Brother Goss, the church in Keswick, the family, Brother Goss's family. We've had them on our prayer requests and mentioned them on almost every service, so keep them in your prayers too. Sister McNabb, called and let us know that she's just she's wore out tonight and just said I I don't know I guess she went to bed earlier or whatever she couldn't be on tonight anyway uh 
let's all, if you would, let's just unmute your microphones and pray together here before we, let me close the, stop the recording. Yeah.